All right. Welcome everyone to the February 7th meeting of the Parks and Rec Commission. Okay. Will the staff secretary please call roll? Okay. Commissioner Alexander. Commissioner Bridge. Here. Commissioner Esparza. Here. Commissioner Pollock Cushing. Here. Commissioner Randolph. Here. Commissioner Suchek. Here. Commissioner Stearns. Here. Commissioner Panchal. Here. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll do the pledge. And uh, Tanvi, will you please lead us with the, with the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, next up, public comment, and seeing as we have no public here tonight, um, I think we will open and close that unless we had any phone. No? Nope. Okay. So uh, we will close public comment. And moving in to the minutes, uh, approval of the minutes from the last meeting. And just for clarity, this is uh, this is the last open session meeting. The uh, one over here, not the special session minutes That's, that you. Yes, oh, correct. All yes. right. So yeah, uh, we'll approve the meeting of uh, December sixth. Sorry. Perfect. Motion. Then I motion to approve. All second. Okay. First and second. All in favor of approving the December sixth minutes. All right. All right. Any opposed? All right. Excellent. All right, now we'll move into the presentations. And first up is item 6.1, introduction of commissioners. Uh, well, <laughs> would well, you like to say anything, Jill, or just have us uh, <laughs> begin our introductions? To introduce the item very quickly that um, we do have our new youth commissioner here tonight. Tenby, welcome. And I thought it would be nice if the commissioners did a quick introduction of themselves since this is her first official meeting. Perfect. All right. Andre, would you like to begin? Sure. How are you? Andre Randolph. I don't know how in depth we're going to go. <laughs> how long have you been for, for a little while, <laughs> <laughs> among some others. And <laughs> so, pleasure to meet you. Nice to have you. Hi, I'm Sandra. Um, I just finished my first year on the commission. Uh, it's a great experience. Absorb it all, take it all in. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, somebody, I'm Matt. Um, this is my uh, starting my sixth year. And yeah, like I said, welcome. And my name is Mike Esparza. I'm also serving my sixth year, and um, I was the chair last year. So it's fun. It's more fun to watch someone else be the chair. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, Roy Stearns, and I think this is my eighth and final year. I'm Regina Socek, and this is my third third year. I think third year. And welcome. Yeah, We're it's glad nice to meeting have you. all of you guys. Oh. All right. With that, we will, let's see, we don't have any uh, public to comment on that, so I don't think we need to worry about that one. Uh, next up is the item 6.2, the strategic master plan update uh, with Tara. Good evening, I'm Tara G, your Park Planning and Development Superintendent. And tonight we'd like to share with you information that we shared with some of you during uh, briefings last month. Some of you were not able to attend, so we're uh, giving you a short, short overview of what was shared earlier. <coughs> so in July of 2020, 21, we launched an effort to develop a strategic master plan for the department, and that would be parks, recreation, and libraries. Um, U.S. commissioners recall that you participated in a few of these outreach efforts, including focus group discussions. And so, so far, we've had stakeholder and focus group interviews, uh, completion of a statistically valid survey, completion of the online surveys, 
Park Site Assessments and Library and Parks and Recreation Commission briefings with uh, Council as well as Parks and Recreation Commissioners. We are still collecting and analyzing data. These include benchmark analysis where we compare ourselves to other agencies, program assessments where we are looking at our programs with a critical eye and determining needs, gaps, and satisfaction. A sports tourism strategy will be looked at, um, especially with uh, economic lens, with the drivers being hotel, food, shopping, We'll look at needs and recommendations. And then also we would be looking at level of service where we measure the number of park amenities per 1,000 people and compare with other highly rated agencies, not only here in California, but across the country. We'll also be comparing that to national standards established by the National Recreation and Park Association. So some of the comments we received through the focus groups and stakeholders groups were more sports facilities. That parks does a good job. Um, we should look at more art, uh, performing arts, more restrooms, no major barrier, barriers or accessibility issues were identified. People feel welcome, parks are well used. There are some homeless concerns Additional comments also include need for specific facilities and amenities, more focus on low income and non-English speaking part populations and to keep doing and adding more street festivals and events. With the community survey, the dots on this map show where people live and who responded to the statistically valid survey. You can see that this map shows a, a pretty even distribution throughout the city. Over 500 people completed the survey. Our goal was to ensure it was statistically valid, so that required a little over 400 completed surveys. So you can see we had quite a good showing. I've given you a slide deck of some of the findings, but in uh, the essence of time for this commission meeting, I'll highlight a few of these. When asked what prevents you from visiting a parks and recreation facility, 28% of the respondents said they don't know what was offered. 27.3% didn't have time and 21.8% used private facilities. It's good to know that 18.8% visit our facilities often. How well an amenity or facility needs are currently being met the top, top are 50% of diamond fields are being met. Rectangular fields is 48%. Outdoor basketball, walking paths and trails, indoor event space, meeting rooms, and dog parks fell very close in the 30% range. The top amenities that were most important to residents were walking and biking trails at 64.8% and dog parks at 22%. And this is no surprise, especially since these two amenities were very much highlighted during COVID and still are to, for people to get out and exercise. For programs, what programs are most important? In the top three were fitness and wellness, low cost community events and cooking classes. Events attended in the past two years is, um, includes concerts in the town square, holiday tree lighting, and concerts in the park. Now this question is typically asked, um, how many events are, do you, have you attended in the past year? And you can see here that we asked over the past two years and that is again because of COVID. There's also interest in our cultural arts and events with downtown events, outdoor concerts, craft and vendor fairs, and holiday events um, making the top four. The online survey uh, was conducted in the month of January and we had 1438 respondents, which is quite a bit of, of uh, feedback that our consultants right now are, are reviewing those and what they'll do is compare those um, comments with the statistically valid survey. So it'll be very interesting to see how those align or not. For site assessments, 
The consultant evaluated 25 parks using a score sheet that rated each of the categories shown here. This score sheet will become a tool that staff can use in the future to rate the remaining parks. Six parks were identified as benchmark parks, two on the citywide category, Crab and Central, two on the school park category, and that would be Stizzo and Nichols, and two neighborhood parks, our newest Rokuchi and Phillips Park. So older, more established parks were assessed, and they were compared in relationship to the benchmark sites. And those benchmark sites, we really chose them because they're some of our newer parks in, in great condition. So the key findings regarding access and connectivity, gateways and edges, um, some opportunities for stronger identity, visibility, and street access, they, they were noted. Clear pedestrian access, um, looking at if you, you notice Mighty and you have the path of travel and pedestrian access highlighted going through parking lots and walkways. So they encourage to do more of that when we have parking lot situations. And uh, trail integration, trails could be more integrated with parks. Uh, the, one of the prime examples or two of the prime examples are what we did with Rakuchi Park and Phillips Park. Experience and sense of safety. Natural features and characters are definitely add a lot to a park, and they liked, uh, an example of what they liked was Diamond Oaks Park. Uh, creating identity, so where we don't have topography to play with, we use themes in the play areas or other park amenities, and so those were highlights as well. Shade, as we all know, is, is very important, and some of our newer parks where we don't have a lot of mature trees that shade, um, man-made shade uh, installed or included in those parks were really important. And the visibility sight lines are, are very vital. And most notably, they, they more, uh, noted Weber Park as being a challenge, and we, we all know that. Um, and then lastly, condition and functionality. Ground level planting, rec they recommend some landscape upgrades. Tree conditions, specifically in turf areas, need more protection to stay healthy. Man managing water use noted were some wet spots, some ponding, and so we need to look at our improved irrigation systems and water management. And upgrading amenities, they noted some amenities are in need of upgrades or replacements. So this next slide here is using the worksheet that scored these various categories. There was an overall score. And the green lines on the left, the six, six are the benchmark parks. And they were compared to the 19 more established parks. And you will see that Weber is on the far right, is noted as poor, which again we're working on with uh, uh, residential and um, special interest groups to help identify some solutions to improve that park site. So the key takeaways are larger community parks are desired to balance out the system. Um, building awareness of our facilities and programs and services would be key. Creating a connected trail system in the city to maintain a self safe and healthy community. Creating more events and group gatherings to bring the community together, creating more sports parks for use by the local community as well as to support sports tourism, taking care of what we already own, um, find a dedicated source for parks, recreation, and libraries to maintain it for the future, find ways to use open space land for self-directed recreational purposes, and activate spaces to create value and appreciation. I wanted to share with you that we are Parks, Recreation, and Libraries. And while I did not mention anything about libraries, a concurrent and parallel process is underway. The final strategic master plan will combine the findings of all of the department key areas in one comprehensive plan, thus creating a full vision and a roadmap for the future. As far as the timeline, we're hoping to see a draft in April or May, and hopefully a final draft in June or July. 
so one last thing as part of the outreach, we do have a February 17th virtual public workshop. It starts at 6.30 p.m. and you can register at the, the link shown here, it's www.roseville.ca.us and future PRL. So this concludes my presentation and I stand re ready to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you, Tara. Um, Commissioner, did you have any questions, comments? Audrey? Again. No, um, great report. I get nerdy with the stats, so that was good. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Tara, I saw a bocce ball in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, my, uh, I had mentioned it at the last meeting, but my um, concern was the traffic issue leading into West Park, um, since this is where most of the development is going to be. Is the consulting group looking into making sure the people want, you know, they'll say that they want something built, but do they, are they being made aware of kind of the side effects of getting something new in the area? Well, we, we that's like a good question. Pe like I think I had mentioned, like bringing people that necessarily weren't from Roseville here, that, you know, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. I just feel like there's a, you know, each, the coin can go get tossed on all these questions probably. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Just it, there's a balance yeah. um, with regards to that. And anything that is proposed or uh, a park during the specific plan or long range planning process, we look at um, road capacity. We look at traffic um, service levels. If we have service levels for park amenities, we definitely have service levels for parks. I mean, I'm sorry, streets and how much traffic is brought in. We do look at major roadways too, and how um, you know we're careful about putting in amenities, especially specialty amenities in neighborhood parks where there are concerns about bringing lots of people into a neighborhood. And so um, trying to, to find locations for specialty amenities that would or could attract a greater number of people, we look at putting those into our citywide parks where it has the parking capacity, which has the road infrastructure that supports it as well. So it's all a balancing act um, with regard to what, where, and why. Uh, Jill, did you want to add anything else? No, I think the, well, yes, I will add one thing. Um, because, uh, Sandra, I think part of your question was revolving around the, the regional soccer complex that's exactly. proposed. Yeah. And Tara actually is going to be making a presentation on that next. Okay. And um, I guess, well, and also, I guess West Park is just going to keep getting more and more developed. So uh, it's first the soccer complex, but then, you know, I'm sure there's more stuff coming down the road. Yes. Um, and, and with all that development, as she said, traffic studies are done, yeah, um, you know, the CEQA studies are done. And so that's in process right now for the specific soccer complex that we yeah, were talking about. The traffic about. has even gotten worse down Pleasant Grove just from that shopping center. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough street lights to even cross Pleasant Grove to get from one side to the other. So um, I was standing there for seven minutes yesterday trying to get across with my kids and, you know, there was just no stop, no stop light, no anything. So we had to kind of bolt. But um, as a West Park resident myself, I I definitely want to have the benefits, but I am concerned about the other side of it. <laughs> so. yeah, thank you, Mike. Oh, nothing for me. Thank you. Nothing for me. Looking forward to seeing the final report. Yeah, same. Well, thank you, Tara. Um, and don't believe we did. We don't have to do public comment on that one, right? No, you can just mention that um, there is no one here from the public tonight to okay. comment on that, so we can open up close and move on. Okay. Um, so, being that there's no one from the public, we will open and close the public comment on that item. And next up is item 6.3 the regional soccer complex update from Tara. All right, this will go right into Sandra's question here. <laughs> so this is an information item providing an update on the regional sports complex. The location of the complex is in West Roseville on Westbrook Drive adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant in Energy Park. The original acreage of the park was 25 
acres with a small three acre park site immediately north and adjacent to the park. The city is in the process of acquiring an additional 20 acres to the immediate south of the parcel, making this a 48 acre site. We're also looking at the possibility of using about 1.5 acre portion of the parcel next to our small park site on the north. This is currently owned by the city, but other uses by the electric department are being considered for the larger portion of the parcel. So we're working through what is necessary, um, what will be good for uh, both the soccer complex as well as the uh, electrics project. So we've done some public outreach, discussions on needs and support features. Um, for over a year, we've been discussing with various uh, soccer groups. We've reviewed a number of layouts, and recently we held a public uh, meeting, a virtual one, where 27 attended with a dozen or more staff and consultants in attendance as well. Well, not necessarily a public outreach effort. Staff has been working on very, very a number of variations of this concept layout. Um, we're also been working on a feasibility study and, and have been researching successful soccer venues to see what works and maybe what doesn't work. So what we presented the other night was a concept plan. And so I'll walk you through this real quickly, starting from left to right of your screen. That brown area there on the left represents a space set aside for a universally accessible playground. Next to it is a parking lot, as you can see, and then just above it in that gray is a small um, corporation yard, probably about the size of the corporation yard over at Maidu Regional Park. Next to the parking lot, is a plaza which has restrooms, shade structures, and other components like that. And then this graphic shows the potential of 10 long fields. Soccer, of course, but other um, components or other sports could be played on this as well. Um, next to the front three soccer fields is a potential for another plaza with the same amenities, restrooms, shade, picnic area, and such. And then, of course, a, another parking lot. So the key to this or the, the concept or the vision is to make parking very convenient. And so using the parking lot would be easy to use. You'll notice the driveways are shown here, and they align with two signalized intersections. So, um, you know, that's key, too, because Westbrook is a well-traveled road. And so trying to make it that it is easy to get in and out is our goal. And one last thing on the northern parking lot, I failed to mention right to that end of that one field between the corporation yard and the first field that's shown there is a potential for a connection to Phillips Road. So in a busy time, the exit can be two ways out of the parking lot, thus distributing the traffic and um, making sure that people are, it can get in and out pretty easily. The complex is planned to be fenced, except for the playground. We want the playground to be accessible to people um, at all times. Um, there's also included in here a walking path that ranges from 1.2 to 1.5 miles, depending on the loop you choose to walk. And of course, it has sports lighting. The base proposal includes six fields, one plaza, appropriate parking, and the universally accessible playground. When we bid the project, we plan to bid an ad alternate in case we get competitive pricing and can build more and make this an eight field complex at, at its initial um, completion. And that would add two more fields, a plaza, plus the necessary parking needed to support the two additional fields. And then finally, um, two additional fields in a, in a future phase would be added pending financing and uh, the associated parking to go along with that. So at the public workshop, we had quite a bit of feedback. Um, in the other uses, lacrosse was specifically asked about, and yes, 
Um, this can be played on these fields as well as rugby um, or any other sports needing rectangular fields. Parking, uh, the question was, was there en enough? Well, we did take a conservative approach. So we have 96 spaces per field. In early concepts, there was something around 80 to 85, and that was comparable to the first effort of the sports complex, if you recall, the Placer Valley tourism uh, scenario. And so we did take a more conservative approach just to make sure that there was plenty of parking that that would be available for this. We are also looking at different approaches to parking lot management. One was to have permitted parking as part of registration for tournaments, making it really easy and convenient for people to use the parking. Um, and also, you know, another trick, if you will, is to manage game schedules to alleviate as much overlap as possible. In the north port parking lot, there's about 360 stalls. In the south parking lot, there's about 250 stalls. Traffic was another comment, um, and it, uh, you know, the comment was about traffic concerns, much like um, Sandra had mentioned. And there was also mention of traffic experience at the Davis complex, where I-80, if you've ever got, gotten caught in that, and I know I have, um, you know, we certainly don't want to duplicate that, that scenario. But it is good to note that the Davis complex has 16 fields, and so it's almost, you know, quite a bit, not almost, it's quite a bit more than what we're planning here. The, a traffic study as part of the CEQA process is underway, and so the traffic, um, you know, consultants will be looking at, again, level of service, how much the roads can handle, um, where the where the traffic would impact the most, and so that's more to come. They did do a traffic study, the same, the same in consulting firm did a do a traffic study for the Placer Valley concept, and so they're very knowledgeable about um, what we're trying to do here and accomplish with a soccer complex. Pedestrian access to nearby schools was another question, and at this point, none have been established. We know that alternative transportation has been looking at this. However, providing and creating a safe east-west connection, which is you'd have to go uh, connect the neighborhood to the east, to the, the high school to the west, has been a little bit of a challenge, but we continue to look at that. Um, there was a question about lighting and how long it would stay on, and so we'd look at that 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock hour, um, much like all of our other uh, lighted facilities. There was a comment about the surface perimeter path, if we would consider other material other than asphalt, and so certainly we can look at it. Funding and budgeting um, would be a consideration, of course. Uh, there was a question about adjacency to the wastewater treatment plant and the energy park, if there were any hazardous impacts to people being that close. And a study was conducted with the, when these facilities were built, and the study showed that there are no impacts. The CEQA process, um, so we'll go through that a little bit. The technical studies will include traffic, noise, and light studies. Those are the three big ones um, when you look at a complex of this size. Studies will take about six weeks and they will be incorporated in the final report and it will be anticipated to be an initial study and a mit mitigated neg negative declaration, <laughs> call it NEGDEC, which will take about five to six months to complete. Um, there was a question about security, mainly at night, and the complex is intended to be fenced and closed off. The economic impact, there was a comment about that. This project can lead to positive impacts to Roseville's economy. It will impact, in a positive way, hotel stays, shopping, and food and beverage. More definitive impacts may be identified, and a sports tourism strategy is part of our strategic master plan, so that'll be incorporated into the report as well. So timelines, CEQA, as I mentioned, review will be five to six months out. So the uh, 
the commission, we would bring the final master plan here to the commission, hopefully in March or April, and then to the master plan approval and adoption of the CEQA to city council in June. And our goal to break ground is spring of 2023. This will be a, a approximately 18 month construction project. So completion is targeted at the end of 2024. So next steps, we are going to meet with all the various city departments and uh, understand what their concerns might be or things that might be incorporated into the overall plans. Um, again, we'll complete the environmental review and then bring the master plan approval forward. So this is an information item at this point. No action is currently being re required. I'll turn it back to you for any questions or comments. Oh, thanks, Tara. Uh, this time we'll start comments uh, any, with you, Tanvi. Um, no, I don't really have any questions or comments. But yeah, thank, yeah, you. thank you. So it looks like um, if it was all built out, there's almost like 900 and something parking spaces in there. Yeah. So about how much does that kind of equate to per game if you're kind of thinking about parents, kids, ref, you know, refs, all that, and what kind of extra is built into that? Did they kind of have a, a rough order of magnitude on that? Um, the last numbers I saw was something like 17 cars per field. Mm -hmm. um, and so they did do a formula like 1.6 per player, and they did accommodate or account for um, referees, um, parents and all of that. So that 96 per field is, is now we're not going to pretend to say that that's going to resolve every issue that's out <laughs> there, but we're, we, we are trying to take a very conservative approach to make sure that there's plenty of parking mm -hmm. available. Yeah. It seems pretty field. generous. Go ahead. Did you say 17 cars per field is what I'm you're sorry per team? Yeah. Okay. Per team. Oh, per so, team. Yeah. Double that. I, I missed Double that. Sorry. <laughs> I have a couple of comments. The first one is about this place. The lights up here glare in here, and you just can't see the, 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 what the presentation is. You have to kind of keep leaning over. If we could shoot out these lights, that would be great. So you can see these. These are worthless in some places. Now, other than that, I went out and drove around that place today, and I thought the idea and the diagram I see looks really, really good. I like it, and I support it, and we should do it. Uh, but I also drove along the, uh, the housing side, and I drove in and out of almost every little cul-de-sac there, and it dawned on me, uh, it, a lot of those cul-de-sacs already are filled with cars from the people who live there, but there are three fields that are directly adjacent to those, those cul-de-sacs, and those could be filled with people who want a quick walk from the cul-de-sac to the field that's closest to them. And I think that's a problem. Well, again, I think that's a good point. And um, the layout of the parking lot makes it so that you're, if you use the par north parking lot as an example, you would be closer to those fields than parking across the street and into the residential area. And it would probably be harder to get out of the residential area as well. So again, the key is to create um, easy accessible parking closer to the fields than um, encouraging people to use the, the residential areas. And then also keep in mind that Westbrook's pretty a pretty major street, so it would be difficult to cross it um, easily. Um, what happens a lot with these tournaments, especially in Dustin can even uh, attest to that, is people bring picnics and coolers and pop-up tents and everything like that. And so parking at the facility is going to be a lot easier to get all that stuff over to their field than it would be to park in across Westbrook and into a neighborhood. I, I think that's well and good, but knowing how people sometimes with their kids get to an event and jump out of the car and park any place, you know, that they can, I worry about how those residents are going to see an impact come down their cul-de-sac because it's a circular drive down at the end, and several of them already had cars parked where it said no parking. And so I, 
but I don't see a way you can massage that plan with those three fields on that side to where you could dissuade people from jamming into those residential areas. So I think that needs a very close look. What's the signage around Royer Park? Isn't there um, on the... Yeah, there's a... thing to that effect, you know. Yeah, you're right. The yeah. Royal Park is, on one side is parking in front of the residents, and then on the park side, actually, there's no parking because it's a one-way street, and so we need to give uh, plenty of room for that. I think one of the parking lot management components, and I don't know, Jill, if you want to speak to that, is, is you know, you're going to get a parking permit when you register, at, at least one scenario, and so you already have your... Um, parking instructions and, and we're going to have to work with these groups to make sure that they understand where parking is available. And so it may take a little bit of training, if you will, to do that. But, you know, again, trying to strike that balance of keeping people out of the neighborhoods and providing that parking easy in, easy out is going to be key. Yeah, one additional comment I might add is this this is going to be a fenced facility. The fields are not going to be open for people to jump on any time of day. So there will be points of entry. And so the most convenient place for people to park is going to be in the parking lot. If they parked across the street in the neighborhood, they would have to walk through the parking lot around to the point of entry into the fields as well. That may take a, a time or two for them to, to recognize that. But truly, the parking, designated parking, is the most convenient parking for the complex. Just one other question, maybe I missed this. Is there an office, kind of a, a check-in facility at these uh, soccer fields where if I come from Rockland and I'm not sure where my kid is playing, I can pull in and ask the office, team six is on what field? Oh, oh they're down here. Is there anything like that to help steer people in the right direction? We Well, we're looking at those two plazas being check-in points. Um, so, uh, again, if you were signed up for a tournament, we would give you the schedule and your location prior to you showing up. And the goal is for the fields to be very well marked. So for like a practice, if you know you're practicing on field six, you're going to be able to walk up and see right away where field six is. Good plan. I hope it comes to fruition <laughs> with all problems solved. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this this is very interesting. It's something that kind of piques my interest too, because um, the past ten years I've been driving my kids to these tournaments and and lugging stuff in and out of cars to get to the games. Um, Davis is a fantastic complex. It's it's one of the best in the state or in multiple states that I've been to. Uh, but the big issue they have there is the one and the one exit there, and then limited parking. Um, and looking at this, it's not. It's a, it's a good size complex, um, similar to Davis, and it does have three exits. Uh, I was just kind of curious about, you had that top left um, on the slide, the top left side where it went to Phillips Road. Um, is there one on the top right side that can also get to Phillips Road? I'm not familiar with what Phillips Road, if it connects um, on that right side as well, but I'm just curious. Yeah, unfortunately, if, you, if we were to, to put a road, to that side, we'd be in the wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other thought I had uh, was the, the thing that would deter people from parking inside the complex and, and would park in the neighborhood would be if there was uh, a, a, co a cost to pay to park, uh, which does happen a little bit at, at Davis and things because it's an expensive complex, complex and they need the money to, to keep it afloat. Um, something like this, I'm imagining, is probably all turf, right? So there's, yes, we're, we have a lean toward artificial turf since it's lighted, and our it looks like our, our best opportunity is during the shoulder seasons, so that's a water season. And so, um, you know, trying to target where we have the best economic impact, that wetter season makes sense to go with artificial turf. And there's the less long-term, I mean, the less maintenance of keeping yes. the grass alive and all that. Correct. So the need for pay to parking would be less, I would imagine, for that, for that standpoint. We do envision pay to park for tournaments, mm -hmm. but the way we've uh, proposed that we would facilitate that is we would build it into the team's 
registration fees, and that's what Tara's talking about, then they would get a parking pass so that we're not collecting money as they enter the park. That's one thing that would create a backup. Uh, so that would traffic. be run by city employees or the tournament staff? We would charge the tournament, I guess I should say. We would charge the tournament for the parking up front, and then they could build it into their Oh, they could do what they fees. wanted to. Mm -hmm. They could do what they want with that. But it's not our plan to collect parking fees as people enter the complex, because we know that creates traffic issues as well. No, it, it looks uh, long overdue. It looks like I'm kind of bummed my kids will probably be too old to, to be able to play on it, but uh, it's pretty neat, neat concept. Yeah. Uh, I think you answered my question on the, the turf or grass, um, and I think that was, oh, is there any, um, any discussion still with Placer um, Valley Tourism? Or are they? I think there's some interest in it, and we're we're on uh, having ongoing discussions. Okay, they're certainly interested in helping us promote the facility, right. and you know, at a national level, help attract tournaments to this facility. Okay. And I have one more follow-up question before you. We want um, just real quick question about um, shade, like shade trees, and I know there's shade structures, but I did see on the map there was looks like a, a row of trees. Um, plant, were those going to be like smaller trees or established trees to begin with? I think they're, well, they're, they're certainly not going to be established initially. Um, it, I think that's still on a conceptual level. One of the things we're looking at as well is working with uh, electric department to see what kind of interest that they have in putting up solar panels, which can be used as shade, um, both on the parking lot or as an ex part of the experience inside the complex. It's We're at the very beginning stages of that conversation. It may not pencil out for them, but um, they are interested in exploring that. Uh, Sandra? Yeah, I have um, a few questions. Uh, one is, um, what was the space between the fields? Because they looked kind of close, and if you have soccer balls flying, and you know, the you need space for sidelines for the parents to stand on, I couldn't tell from that um, what the spatial arrangement actually was field to field um, on sides and um, by the goals. So I don't have the exact dimensions, but it, it was planned to have plenty of space so that he, not only the parents can sit and watch, but also could be used for warm-up space as well before the games. So um, there, the if you can see it, it's, it's light green. Um, in fact, the the uh, thank you team. Okay. So the the graphic on the bottom there it shows the layout. So the dark green is actually a regulation size field, and then the light green is either sitting space or warm up space. You can also see as well if we wanted to play short fields, it's in the blue line. Depending on the age group, we could we could also play that. Um, when we do play that, there's there's discussions about, you can see one of the larger fields on the short field side is close to the concrete, that there would be like netting or curtains that would come down mm -hmm. and be able to keep people safe from flying balls. <laughs> and Tara, I believe it was either a 10 to 15 foot apron all the way around oh, the field, okay. so it's a good distance even though it might not look like it here. And then on the end goals, there would be tall fences there, so when the kids oh. are shooting on goal, it would keep the ball from going to the next field. Oh, great. Okay, yeah, that wasn't too clear by that diagram. Um, my second question is, now, in order to get to the soccer complex, you're going to have to cross, go over Bob Doyle, um, I assume, uh, Bob Doyle Road, Street, whatever it is, which has the all the school junction and Chilton and the, the new high school. If there's a soccer tournament or games going on when the drop off, during drop off and pick up time, the traffic is already horrendous over there. There would be so many more, it might be a ton more cars trying to enter that area. Um, all trying to get past the schools. Is that um, gonna, has that been thought out or is this strictly gonna be like a Saturday, Sunday 
complex only, only open yeah. for Tur tournaments. Yeah, like, tournaments are generally Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Um, it could be a holiday weekend as well, right. so a three-day tournament. So school will likely not be impacted by that. Okay. The the hope is that they, for anybody who is actually out of town, they would come down Blue Oaks to Westbrook. Oh, and so okay. they could stay out of the residential neighborhoods. That would be great. And then the last question was, um, you mentioned that there's not no hazard, nothing hazardous from being by the wastewater treatment plant, but what about the smell in the hot summer months when, and I know, and I know this is supposed <laughs> to be question. more in the shoulder seasons, right. like in the spring, but um, I, as a player, former player and as a current parent, um, that might be make the experience a little less enjoyable? We're, yes, and we've talked about that. We will need to coordinate with uh, the wastewater treatment plant. Generally speaking, it's a, several times uh, a year that, they, that you have that smell that yeah. they're doing some operational thing. And so we would try to coordinate it that hopefully we can do it on Monday through Thursday versus Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, we definitely don't want this smell to be a deterrent and that be the only um, memory of this <laughs> complex. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm so excited for this. I remember when this first kicked off and sitting in with the uh, tourism and we were looking at 10 and then had to cut down to eight, you know, and that's so to see you put 10 back in. Um, and that is fantastic. Um, as somebody who has thrown a number of tournaments throughout uh, these years and trying to leverage the various high schools and all that for fields, that kind of thing, this is amazing. Um, I noticed, I, I think during the first plans we were talking about possibly like um, the concession stand or something like that, but if that's not there, I do like the idea of having areas for food trucks, you know, bringing that in. So. Um, I'm a huge fan of this. This is like long overdue. Not not as far as nobody doing anything, but just from uh, you know someone who's been a commissioner and president of leagues, that kind of thing. Like my eyes are wide open for that and for the city of Roseville. Just I, I remember um, I can't remember the numbers, but the potential uh, that this brings in of being that destination for folks is just astronomical, which is great for the city. So excellent work. Excellent. Well, thank you, Andre. Yeah. And, and uh, to mention, because I didn't mention it, is that there is uh, in the plaza areas uh, places for food trucks to yeah. drive up. And knowing that food trucks is could be a trend or could fade out, that there is space to do those permanent concession stands as well. Yeah. Excellent. That, that was a great alternative to building a structure for that or having to worry about someone managing that aspect of it. Um, and then also it helps boost the, you know, that local economy on the food truck folks um, throughout, you know, business. So that, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. I have just a couple of final comments, if I might. And I don't know if they're final. I want to give Tara the opportunity to, to speak some more as well, or any of you. But uh, back to Sandra's question about the school day and whether it could interfere with that. We do envision use of these fields on weekdays. Uh, we know that there are teams that are going to want to practice. And so in the evenings, they're w they will be open even on the weekdays, but still not to interfere with the school day because that's when the kids are in school. They wouldn't be available until later. So I just didn't want to give the impression that we were only envisioning using this complex on weekends. Yeah, we do okay. envision weekdays as well. Okay. And then the last thing was, again, just to, to address the parking one more time is, as Tara mentioned, 17 players per team, okay, comes out to 30, 34 for the two teams times uh, a crossover the new teams are coming while the old teams are still there. That takes us to 68 cars that could be there, and we're planning for 96 cars per field. So we've allowed for additional officials, uh, some parents that may come in separate cars. So again, it's a fine balance that you don't want to build a concrete jungle, but you also uh, don't want to not have enough parking. So we really do feel like the 96 
cars per field is going to accommodate the needs. And again, that's if all 10 fields are in use or all six fields or however many we build at that time. So again, just wanted to let you know how we kind of arrived at the parking numbers. Thank you. All right. Uh, you know, cool. just yeah. one quick question on that with being, being a long field. Um, uh, was there any talk about football um, with this, you know, be it, uh, you know, a flag, you know, that kind of thing, or be it tackle football as far as markings, field markings, that kind of thing? So what we're, if it's an artificial turf, the um, thought is that we would sew in the lines for soccer. Yeah. And for any other additional sports, paint. football, yeah, it would be a water-based paint yeah. during those times of use. Perfect. Need. Yep. Well, um, we'll open that up for public comment and close it as we still don't have public. Um, and uh, thank you, Tara. Next up is item 6.4. For the Youth Sports Coalition member appointee presented by Dustin. All right. Hello, Commissioners. My name is Dustin DiPlacido, Recreation Library Supervisor, and I'm here tonight as a staff representative for the Youth Sports Coalition to request a Parks and Recreation Commissioner to join the Youth Sports Coalition. Currently, the three commissioners that are part of the Youth Sports Coalition are Commissioner Esparza, Commissioner Bridge, and Commissioner Socek. Commissioner Esparza has been a member of the Youth Sports Coalition for a few years, and at this time, he is stepping down from the coalition, having served as the chair, vice chair, and a member at large. His assistance on the Youth Sports Coalition has been a great contribution, and he will be missed. Per the Youth Sports Coalition meeting procedures, the Parks and Recreation Commission appoints the three commissioners. Commissioner Bridge and Commissioner Socek will remain on the Youth Sports Coalition. Therefore, this evening I am asking for a nomination for a third representative. This is an action item that will require a motion to proceed. Okay, thank you. So first up, do we have anyone that's interested? I would do it. I've served on it for yep. a number of years, yeah. President or what is a commit chair. Uh, chair and vice chair. So definitely want to open that opportunity to those who have not. Perfect. Okay. Um, so do we have a uh, motion? That, um, let's see. Well, first, we will open and close the. We'll comment on that. Uh, open and close the public comment on that first. And now we will see if there's a uh, motion on that one. So moved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a motion to appoint uh, Sandra. Okay. Second. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So a uh, motion to approve Sandra to the Youth Sports Coalition. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. Thank you. A good time. Yeah. It's a great group of folks. My kids are right at that age. So yeah, it's no, really, it's really, yeah, really no, good. it's really good. Yeah. Okay. Then moving on, next up. Item 6.5, the appointment of a 2022 chair and vice chair to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Jill. So as we begin each year, it is time to appoint a new chair and vice chair to your commission because we didn't have a regular meeting in January. We are doing so this month. Um, Matt Bridge has served as your chair for the past year and Regina as your vice chair. So I will turn it back over to you for discussion and nomination for a new chair and vice chair for this year. Uh, any, does anyone have any comments, uh, suggestions? Does anyone, is anyone interested? I'll step up to chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's well, fine. And uh, maybe, is Sandra, you ready for vice? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> We will uh, throw that to public comment and uh, close it again. Uh, and so then do I have a motion on? Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, move Regina into the chair position and Sandra would take over the vice chair for the 2022 year. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, congratulations, Regina and Sandra. And thank you for a great year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, next up, we've got the board member and staff report. 
Do you have anything to share? I really don't have a formal staff report tonight. What? I don't know if any of my colleagues do. I know. <laughs> you, you've heard so much tonight about the exciting things that are going this on. Is, this is, it was so cool. We've yeah. been spending a this lot of good. time on our strategic master plan, which, like Tara mentioned, should be done later this spring, early summer. Um, and putting on our regular programs and events. In your packet, uh, you will see the year-end program indicators that show um, how we performed this past year compared to the year before. And, you know, with 2020 being much of COVID, there are two reports in here. One was for November and one was for December since uh, we didn't have a January meeting. But if you look at that December report, those really are our year-end numbers. And um, a couple of items that we've talked about is how golf has increased over the years. And last year we had 110,000 rounds of golf at our courses versus 106,000 the year before. And pre-COVID we were ranging between 80 and 90,000 rounds per year. So COVID has been good for golf. And then the very bottom category is our facilities. And you can see how our, our use picked up once uh, we could start opening our doors again. We had over 1.1 million visitors to our facilities in 2021 versus just about 300,000 in 2020. So we look forward to continuing those numbers in 22. Great. Uh, question. I have one oh. last question. Yeah. Um, are there any plans in the works for more of the fit, the outdoor fitness facilities like at, my, at Maidu? Like that, I think that is such a great idea that just could get rolled over into so many of the other parks. Yeah, I'll let Tara answer that. Yeah, well, that um, fitness court is sponsored by the National Fitness Campaign, and so we are still working with them to identify other areas and other opportunities in the either central and west part of town. So we want to try to geographically locate those. Okay. So, yeah, well, I was going to open that up to the commission comments. So, uh, oh, Andre, you want Great work. Okay. Excellent work. Uh, Sandra, did you have anything else? No, no. Okay. Uh, I had a question on the uh, the work we you were doing with the community and uh, Highland Reserve for the Boljan um, Park. Um, is there any timeline on on that? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a definitive date on it. Uh, we did order the material and the new equipment many, 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 many months ago. However, with manufacturing delays, it's been really challenging to find a date or to have a date that they could deliver on. Uh, last week I talked to the vendors and uh, they indicated that about 100 people in their manufacturing plant are out with COVID and so they're unable to tell us when they're going to be able to get back to, to production again. Okay, great. And have you been in co um, contact with the, the group from Highland Reserve that um yeah, they have a liaison that we've been communicating with. Thank you. Oh, yeah, nothing for me. Thank you. Regina? Nothing for me. All right, make it easy on you tonight. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, we'll do have a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll see you in March. Thank you. Chair Matt, thank you. Matt, excellent job. Thank you for your work you put in. <laughs>